Welcome to Comic Book News. I'm your old pal, Dan Shaheen. Today, I got a really fun show. We're going to talk to none other than Ben Dunn of Antarctic Press. You might know him from Ninja High School. You might know him from The Warrior Nun, Ariala. Or you might know him from uh, the Marvel Mangaverse. We're going to talk to him about those projects and a lot of other stuff today. Um, hey, if you're watching live, please consider hitting that subscribe button down there. If you like this show... Um, hit the thumbs up. If you don't, you can click that thumbs down. I won't take it personally unless you don't leave a comment telling me why. So give us some feedback. We appreciate it. Um, what else? Uh, today's show is really exciting. I can't wait to get it started. But before I do, um, what have I got coming up? I don't know. Nothing. I don't have any guests planned immediately. I have a few cooking in the works, but man... As I've told you before, it's very hard. Uh, the scheduling is the hardest part of this show. Getting people I want to talk to, there's plenty of them. Getting a hold of them, a little, little easier. And then, but then getting them, pinning them down to a date and a time, it's difficult for busy people like uh, like I want to talk to. Um, but I also want to hear not just from the Ben Dunns and the comic superstars of the world like that. I want to hear from you. If you want to see your comic books here on the Million Dollar Mailbox, where do you send them? Well, you send them to the Million Dollar Mailbox, P.O. Box, 1163, Arcata, California, 95518. I've actually got two awesome things right here in the Million Dollar Mailbox, so maybe that's what my next show should be. I got stuff from uh, Landon Huber and a uh, friend of the show, Dan Fraga, sent me his uh, rare, kind of hard-to-find uh, book, The Grave. I promised him I'd read it all, including the intro. Maybe we'll even bring Danny in here to talk about it soon. You never know. Hey, if you're watching live and want to ask questions of Ben, you totally get to. Um, but we're going to save that for the Q&A section towards the end. You can chatter away in the comics. You can super chat whatever you want. Um, if I, we see anything interesting, we'll bring it up. But don't count on getting your questions answered until the end, at which time we will answer those questions. So uh, without further ado, I want to bring in my guest today. First, wait a minute. Let me get rid of some of this stuff. And let's bring in one of the more interesting, long-lived publishers in this crazy indie world. I was talking to him backstage. Ben Dunn and I entered co the comic book industry, I think, around the same time. Now, he entered as a publisher in around 1986, 1987, somewhere around there. We'll talk to him about that. I entered in 1986, sorting baseball cards in the back room of Mike's Coliseum in San Jose, California. Uh, but it was a time when just anybody, the barriers to entry of making a, a black and white indie comic ha had, had lowered and it had been proven what you could accomplish with that. And there wasn't a black and white boom. A million publishers came out of that. How many survived to this day? I don't know m many besides maybe the, the guy I'm about to talk to. So without further ado, let me bring in a, a really cool guy, a straight from Texas, I think, right now. Uh, let's bring in Ben Dunn. Hi, Ben. Hello, Dan, my man. How you doing? <laughs> Great. Welcome to, to Comic Book News. Thanks for coming in today. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. So so take me back. And was that, am I right, 87? Is that, the, is that Ben Dunn's entry into comic book publishing? Uh, well, actually, uh, we started Antarctic Press in 1985. Okay. And uh, Ninja High School started in 87. And that's probably where we got it mixed up there. <laughs> Must be. Must be. So what, before Ninja High School, what, what, what was the first um, comic that made you a publisher? Well, we, the first book we actually did was called Mangazine. 
It was a uh, anthology uh, that was primarily manga inspired stories. Um, at the time, manga wasn't really as big then as it is now. <clears throat> and uh, um, we decided, and I loved the art form. I was exposed to it when I went overseas and decided, you know what, I'm going to start bringing manga over to, to this U.S. shores. Well, talk about being ahead of your time. I mean, did you in your in your wildest dreams imagine the day when like manga would dominate the top bestsellers here in the United States? Or did you think that's just a natural progression? Well, uh, you know, when I started, it never occurred to me that, you know, manga would eventually make it you know, here and make it big. It, to me, all I cared about was that I liked the the art style and I wanted to do everything I could to promote it and to uh, uh, make people aware of it. And that's why I decided to go in and start off with the, with that particular title. So I'm not, a, I'm far from a manga expert. I've read tons of comics and I've read a reasonable amount of manga, you know, um, some of the uh, the canon, I suppose. But one thing, tell me if I'm wrong about this. One thing that always struck me as it made it di a little difficult for me to get enter into these manga series was something about backstory. There seems to be a difference in the way m many manga, I don't want to lump them all into one category, treat sort of backstory as a little more implied and less sort of like dominant in the storytelling. Am I right about that or am I just imagining this? <laughs> no, you're probably not imagining it. I mean, the history of manga goes way back to the end of World War II, you know, when uh, um, it was actually Americans who actually started the manga industry in Japan because American GIs during the occupation would bring over comics from the United States. And uh, back then there was no real stigma about reading comics. Uh, everybody read them. They were a cheap way, a disposable way of being entertained, you know. And uh, when they were brought over during the occupation, they left the comics behind, you know. And uh, and kids started reading them or at least looking at the pictures, you know. And then, of course, Japanese were very much into Disney. They loved Disney, you know. And then uh, they decided to, Osama Tezuka was one of the godfathers of the Japanese comic uh, and manga industry. He started drawing comics and they became very successful. And that's when the Japanese started creating their own uh, comic book industry. And uh, the and it just kept growing and growing and growing and it came more and more. The, the thing about it was that uh, there was no real stigma attached. I mean, yes, manga at first was aimed at kids, but as it grew and matured, um, it started to branch out into uh, other age groups and be, there was girl girl comics and all sorts of things and it just grew and grew from there and now the manga industry in japan is huge and tezuka himself he is i mean we're gonna talk he, he he's got to be the i don't know the jack kirby of of japanese comics right i mean the, the one that just provided so many point to as a major influence and has completely influenced what we've seen since. Would you agree with oh, that? Absolutely. Yes. You know, and the thing about it was that uh, Tezuko actually was a medical doctor. He didn't have to draw comics. He could have made quite a wow. substantial living being a doctor, but uh, he decided that he had more enjoyment doing uh, comic books. And uh, he just decided that was the way he wanted to go, you know, and uh, uh, he was the one that was pivotal in creating the uh, Japanese manga industry as we know it today. And so talk about just that for a second, that industry and, and the notion that a cartoonist, something, someone who's, I mean, they're not, I, I wouldn't say they're disrespected, certainly not anymore in this country, but I would just wonder if given the choice being a doctor or a, you know, a, a cartoonist in modern day Japan, I wonder like, it, are, are they viewed as equally respectable occupations or, or endeavors? Well, I can't. I can't speak for for that. I, I do know that uh, Japanese manga creators can become extremely wealthy drawing comics. Sure. You know, sure. I mean, it just it has to be the, the thing about it is that uh, uh, the manga uh, industry is that all the creators they own what they create. You know, the publishers usually just publish what they uh, uh, they do ah. when they're ready to end it. 
then the, and the creator wants to end it, they end it, you know, and then this, you know, paves the way for other creators to come in and create their own new uh, IPs and uh, things like that. So the biggest difference is that in Japan, uh, the people who create the manga, they own every aspect of their creation from, okay. You know, and so I when really they, did not, I did not know that. And it's fascinating because at that time, 86, 87, that was the groundswell, right? Of the indie boom of the print your own of the own your own stuff era. So many publishers came out. How did you, what was your inspiration on the, on the American publishing side? Were you looking at guys like Dave Sim and I don't know who, at Bill Shannis at Pacific Comics or guys like that? Layer. They were the ones who got me into comics. Ace Man and Laird. Ace Man and Laird, right, with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. When they, when they first started, you know, I, I remember seeing their ad in the Comic Buyer's Guide, and I ordered a copy, and when it came in, I just thought, I mean, holy holy crap. I mean, if, if they can do it, you know, anybody can do it. You know, and then uh, the direct market was starting to open up. We had uh, distributors like Capital City, Diamond, you know, uh, Bud Plant, all those guys, they were starting to come up. And at first they were just regional distributors, you know, but hey, they uh, they wanted to carry direct market comics and uh, we were able to uh, have the opportunity to provide that material for them. So uh, it was no longer a uh, Marvel and DC game. It was just about anybody's game who could get a, a listing in one of the catalogs, you know, and just wait for the orders to come in. Hopefully the orders would come in high enough that you could justify uh, producing it and printing it, you know. So it was East Miller who they they blazed the path for almost all independent comics to this day. Yeah, I think even they would they 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 would look though maybe at Dave Sim and some of the guys that came before them a little bit who really pushed that. Bef you know, bef those guys Eastman and Laird hit a huge payday. Not immediately. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not to take away from Dave Sim. Of course, Dave Sim was uh, instrumental, you know, and of, of course, we had the underground comics before then. But yeah, and the underground, know, yeah. They never really made a cultural impact that the Turtles did. You know, the You're thing right. about it was that uh, when the Turtles exploded onto the scene, okay, not only were they, you know, pivotal in selling you know, huge, vast amounts of books. I and mean, before then, and Cerebus and all the other graphic, I mean, yeah, I'm, they were there before, but they didn't have the kind of sales or cultural impact that the Turtles had. You know, the Turtles uh, started off black and white, independent little magazine and became a huge cultural phenomenon, TV shows, movies, everything else like that. It, you know, that it blazed the path that you didn't have to be a Marvel or DC to become, to create something that could have a, a lasting impact, you know, on the culture. I think it, you're right that it may be flipped around in a lot of people's minds about like, why should my dream be to go to work for a Disney, a Marvel, a Warner, a DC and slave to get some crumbs when, you know, it, if my vision is what I, it, if I'm true to my own vision, there's a much, much bigger end game for me. Well, I mean, yeah, back in that the 60, you know, the early days of, of comics, you know, before the before the idea of creator own, you know, uh, materials uh, came about. I mean, that was a problem even back in the seventies. Neil Adams tried to get the rights to Superman back to the the Seagulls and the Schuster because he understood, you know, the injustice that was being perpetrated by the big publishers, you know, when it came to IPs, you know, because there's he were these people who were creating, you know, million billion dollar characters and they weren't seeing a penny of it you know right. and that was totally unfair to uh, uh to to creators because these big huge companies were making large amounts of money off their creations and they wouldn't see a penny of it you know and so that's why i think that uh, things had to change you know and it did show that east Lair showed that you could create something and you could make money and you could own it you know and that's the that's the thing i mean can you imagine, you know, what uh, Len Wein and, and um, Herb Trimpey, he they created uh, Wolverine, okay? I mean, do you think that they're in some sort of mansion where they should be living off the, <laughs> you know, the, the, the royalties of creating a, a, such a seminal character? No, you know, I mean, it's just like, uh, but see, that's the difference between Europe and Japan is that they understand that the creators have to own their material yeah. because they'll be invested in it. And, uh, and they should uh, uh, be able to reap the benefits of their creation. 
I think that also explains something that's never really made, never really clicked for me before about why there's such an amazing creative diversity explosion of different types of manga out there it's because the creators are not forced to, 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 to adhere to an editorial dictum or whatever. They are, they are cre just creating a flood of material that's coming out so fast. And the, the well, readers ultimately are choosing what succeeds. Well, there is a big difference between things in Japan and things here. Um, you know, the, we are encouraged you know, for individuals to create their own thing from the ground up. Now in Japan, there's a, a little bit of a different system. Um, when there's a, a successful manga creator, what he'll do is he'll hire, uh, you know, up and coming artists to work in his studio, you know, and they'll be the ones responsible for like doing backgrounds mm -hmm. or doing the shading or whatever. And then uh, as they learn from this other creator, then hopefully eventually the talented ones uh, will go out and start creating their own manga based on that. And then the whole cycle starts all over again. Now, I'm not saying that all Japanese creators have that system, right. you know, but there's a lot of them who do. And a lot of the people who work for manga creators um, eventually go out and start creating their own manga, you know, and then this way they start creating um, new material. And that's how a lot of American cartoonists, especially from the newspaper sh uh, sort of work, they cultivated ghost artists, whatever, pencilers, anchors, and stu to help f fulfill the, yeah. the, the the need, but control well, the I mean, creative vision. Marvel, Marvel and DC had something of that. I mean, when when uh, when Stan Lee was working at Marvel, he had what is known as the bullpen. I'm not sure if a lot of your readers are familiar with that term, but uh, uh, back in the day, the artist would actually physically go to a location in uh, New York and work in a huge studio where they would be cranking out comics all day long, you know, and then uh, the artists would interact with each other. They'd share ideas. They talk about things. They would, you know, I think that uh, when you have a bunch of artists in a uh, competitive environment, then they strive to do, I'll try to outdo each other, you know, yeah. or they come up with different ideas that they feel like is true. You know, I, I've always liked the bullpen idea. And that one of the things that we did have at Antarctic Press was that we did have uh, a, a sort of a bullpen uh, situation where uh, we would get artists to come down to San Antonio and they would live and uh, stay there and they would draw comics for us. Wow. Uh, CrossGen tried that in Florida, right? Do you remember those guys? Yes, they did try that. And uh, I, I thought that the work that they were producing was actually quite of high quality. Very high quality. Yes, I, I and but I, I think the problem was that the the what they were doing um, wasn't sustainable because the the uh, I, I'm not sure what the page rates were or whatever, but you know uh, it's very difficult to compete with Marvel and DC on on their level, you know. So we know as a small publisher, there is no way we're going to knock out. Uh, Marvel and compete with them because they're just too big. They're the big dogs on campus. So our our attitude was that you should, you know, we would provide material that they weren't doing. You know, Marvel and DC, they do superheroes. If you try to do superheroes and try to compete with Marvel and DC, you're going to get crushed. You know, I mean, yeah, you could probably find a fan base for some of your stuff. I mean, uh, uh, but almost in every instance, any publisher who tried to take them on head to head have utterly failed you know they just can't uh, can't compete with those two because they have the history they have the characters you know they they have the talent so my attitude with antarctic press was that let's provide comics let's take the, sort of the manga attitude let's provide comics uh to people who aren't being served you know because marvel isn't going to do a steampunk comic you know dc isn't going to do a, a furry manga you know so it's it's, it's that so we'll do the kind of comics that, uh, but you will, you man. I know you will. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, also we provide an outlet for new and upcoming creators to showcase their material it's because, yeah. you know, we feel that uh, we have that we the independent publishers, are, or at least for us, is a gateway for up and coming creators to try their hand at things. Because, you know, if if there's no way for them to uh, get their out, work out there, then no one's ever going to discover them. You know? Okay. So now things have changed a lot, yeah. you know, because not almost anybody can 
self-publish. True. But you published some people way back when. I, you know, looking besides the usual suspects of Ninja High School and Warrior Nun, uh, Gold Digger, you know, kind of fit into that uh, manga-ish uh, territory. You also published stuff like, I was looking, uh, Box Office Poison, uh, Battle Girls by Leah Hernandez, or some of her earlier work, and she broke into the mainstream after that, I, I think. think. Battle, Battle Girls was uh, Rod Espinosa. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm <laughs> thinking of the one. Well, who, uh, no, sorry, maybe that's why I confused it. He, he broke into <laughs> no, the no mainstream. Problem. Leah Hernandez did work for us for a little while. She did some stuff for us. Okay, I'm sorry I have that confused. Uh, but Ron Espinoza did break uh, uh, big as well. I thought first yeah. work I saw of his, I thought he this guy's super super yeah. talented. Terry Moore with Strangers in Paradise, and uh, you know we did that. And we, I mean, for the last thirty six years, I mean we've published a lot of creators, and uh, we've you know we've always enjoyed doing uh, things for them, and uh, I, a lot of them have gone to great success. So did you have a threshold back in the day for like how many? How many had to be printed? Like, uh, like what, what, what were you looking for as a, as kind of a minimum to well to be able to support a was, title? Yeah, I was hitting hit and miss back in the day. I mean, the thing was is that uh, uh, we knew that it was important just to get your product out. You know, the the worst thing you can do for a retailer and for a re distributor is to solicit something and then come not come out with it or come out with it not on time, because you know they they count you know, on you to get that product out when you say you're going to get that product out. Now, um, yeah, we, we printed a lot of books that lost us money, but, you know, we thought it was more important just to get the book out, you know, and uh, uh, we didn't have a threshold. We, we were just happy if we made any money at all, you know, to be yeah. honest. Uh, and uh, we were, you know, no problem with that until um, about 20 years ago, uh, Diamond instituted a minimum order policy. You know, and that killed a lot of books, you know, because there was just no way that our books were going to sell. Like that was one of the reasons Ninja High School was. What was that minimum? What was that number? Um, I don't recall exactly. I think it was probably around between a thousand to fifteen hundred, but I don't hold me on that. That was twenty one years yeah, ago. Yeah. So I don't yeah, yeah. But I do know that they did have that. And that was one of the reasons that Ninja High School had to be put on hiatus because it wasn't meeting that threshold. You know, and so uh, we, we I put it on hold, you know, but now uh, I say, you know what, screw it. I'm going to bring it back. You know, I don't care what the minimum. Well, I, I think Diamond's already, I think actually has dropped that threshold minimum. So now I'm sure can, they, they can't be that choosy anymore. <laughs> well, they could be. I just don't know if it's good business, if that's true. Yeah, I don't think they can. They can afford it. Having losing DC, Marvel, they just lost IDW. They're they're hemorrhaging yeah. publishers. Yeah, um, I, are I, you exclusive to to through Diamond in any way, or have any kind of contract in that way? Um, well, back when the uh, uh, the whole exclusive thing started, I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but oh yeah, I'm yeah. sure you know all about that stuff. Um, is that uh, when uh, Marvel tried to distribute on their own? You know, that's because that whole exclusivity thing to go. Yeah, Heroes we offered, World. Yeah, the whole implosion. Yeah. yeah. We were offered exclusivity and we talked about it because we thought that, uh, you know, should we go that route? But then we thought, you know, we just morally, we thought it was not the, it was wrong. You know, and that uh, if we wanted, we wanted to have everyone access to our books. So we turned down the exclusivity thing from Diamond and um, we just, uh, you know, we, Sometimes we thought, well, we, you know, we should have done it. There were certain times during the year we said, like, God, we should have gone with them. But then I, I say, no, you know what? This is the right thing to do. So we should just stick with that. You know, in and the now end, it's you had no choice in the end to go with it. <laughs> like the rest of the market just, I think once Dark Horse made that leap, they had DC. And then once Dark Horse went and the domino started to fall. <laughs> yeah. When, uh, uh, well, actually, when the, the uh, DC uh, became exclusive. To Diamond because of Marvel, um, then that's when things just started to get. Because if you lost DC, the other distributors couldn't uh, they couldn't handle because there was DC was a huge chunk of the market at the time, so there was just no way they could have survived. For those of you who don't know what the heck we're talking about, go check out my video called "The Diamond Age of Comics," all with my interview with Steve Jeffy, and we go through the entire history of Heroes World and the post. Uh, Heroes World implosion and the Diamond 
20 year lock on the industry. Right. Mm -hmm. But so in the midst of all that, so that was kind of though in the midst of that, uh, we had Ninja High School just plugging away. I want you to explain to the people, like, give me the elevator pitch for Ninja High School and and Quagmire High and the 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 where, well, where is that? Series? Where do we want to begin? Uh, well, uh, you know, when um, um, we did Mangazine, of course, I was already manga uh, uh, crazy at the time, and I was also a big fan of anime. Um, you know, anime is the Japanese word for animation. And I was watching a lot of anime coming from uh, Japan. And one of the shows that came over uh, was a show called uh, Urusei Yatsura, which is sort of like a comedy, you know, a romantic comedy with a lot of science fiction elements. You know, the thing was is that the Japanese form of comedy is, is way different than American form of comedy, which is goofy, yeah. over the top. And uh, uh, I said, ah, oh, gosh, this is really a fun, you know, TV show. And then I saw the movie Project Echo, and that was inspired to create my own version of those two uh, anime. And so I started uh, doing Ninja High School uh, because I just thought it sounded cool. <laughs> Ninjas were big, and uh, uh, I thought the juxtaposition of the word high school, and it would be just have a lot of comedic elements to it. So, so I uh, just started uh, sitting there. It was originally going to just be a three-issue miniseries, like on the cover. It was just with three issues. But the response I got was was so overwhelmingly positive that uh, I just decided to keep on going, and it's still going even today. Why do you think that was? What was it is like? Was it a, a hunger for Americanized manga, for lack of a better word, or just a? I you know I really don't know. I mean, I enjoyed doing it. I thought it was fun. It was different. Yeah, I mean, there wasn't a lot of manga at the time, and maybe there was a. Uh, uh, maybe there was a demand for it that wasn't being filled, you know, so people uh, maybe uh, uh, whatever manga fans were out there wanted some sort of fix. And that was what they were able to get at the time. And, you know, and, and so, I mean, you, <laughs> when you referred to a couple of anime that I'll admit, I've never even heard of, let alone seen. So like, what's the pitch for what the universe of, of Ninja high school is. And it literally is like an alternate universe thing going on right well i guess the elevator pitch would be like if uh um it was like archie betty and veronica were set in a really goofy crazy as manga world you know that's basically would be the elevator pitch you know it's about this high school uh where one of the students is suddenly uh thrust into the middle of, of war between a ninja clans and an intergalactic, you know, planetary uh, war. So, uh, and he just wants to be a normal everyday kid. He's just in this situation where there's all sorts of crazy things happen. <laughs> yeah, and that's sort of like every man in just this outrageous world kind of situation. Uh, right. And then all it's these crazy. tropes, all these great tropes that you pull together that we don't, that you're right, that especially at the time, nobody was seeing in american comics right and now this influence has all been absorbed we are in a post manga world in this and i feel like moving forward what's going to happen 20 years from now the kids of today are going to remember the pokemons and the yugios and the whatever anime that they've been watching and absorbing and that's going to i think come to dominate culture adult culture in the future Oh, well, that's great. You know, I always feel there's plenty of room for all sorts of art styles and stories and things like that. I mean, as, as long as mankind continues, we'll always be hungry for new stories, new art, new types of things. And, you know, I'm just happy that uh, things are changing and evolving. You know, that, that's what makes it uh, such you know so interesting, you know, because uh, without that, we'd be stagnant. We'd be, you know, it would be pretty boring. You know, we like to encourage things to change you know we like things to uh, build you know, because everything starts you know with an idea and if you don't get your idea out there then no one's ever going to see it okay speaking of out there ideas ben tell us <laughs> tell us about the warrior nun <laughs> well uh at the time you know there's the early 1990s and the, the whole bad girl thing was starting to 
really accelerate. Uh, with Lady Death was the one, the catalyst that sort of started that whole thing. And uh, uh, we just thought we can't, we had a meeting at Anarchy Press. We said, we got to do something, you know, uh, our own Batgirl uh, comic book, you know, because the comic industry is whenever there's a successful, just like in the movies, whenever there's something successful, everybody has to do their own version of it and hoping to make lightning strike twice. So, uh, but I, I decided, you know what? I'm going to take the opposite approach. I'm going to, instead of doing a bad girl, I'm going to do a good girl. You know, so uh, what is the best good girl you can think of? Well, a nun. So, uh, and plus I thought about my Catholic upbringing um, when I was in school. And I said, boy, some of those nuns were pretty tough. So I just decided to take that <laughs> trope and run with it. <laughs> I'm just you realizing know, said, my long box. Pin here man, gives me a priestly look right now. I didn't really yeah, think about that. Yes, absolutely. You know, <laughs> you know. Plus the the, the whole uh, look and aesthetic. I mean, it just screamed comic book. You know, the, sure. the black and things like that. I mean, it's just like you know, that was one of the things that just made it seem. It's made it work. You know, so I just came up with some uh, far off weird idea, and I just ran with it. Okay, and so. This comic started, what What year did number one come out? Uh, I think it was 1993 or 94, somewhere in that area. Okay. And how long did you continue to publish? Wait, I'm going to remove this for a sec. How long did you continue to, uh, uninterrupted, did Ariella last from this original incarnation? I think the, the, the last Antarctic Press issue uh, ended around... 2002 or 2003, I think. So that's a pretty good 10 years. You know, that's not too bad to, uh, a run for a character like that, you know, but it's still yeah, going fantastic. on today. Yeah. I think Avatar Comics still does a new Warrior Nun comic. So it's definitely still out there. Oh, so you sold off the comic rights to the, to the character at some point? Yes, I did. Um, I was, uh, uh, um, my wife had undergone some uh, medical issues and some surgery. So we uh, had some hospital bills to pay uh, oh, wow. in the, around the mid 2000s. Uh, and so, well, I mean, I don't regret it really. I mean, uh, it helped us out. It saved us when we needed it. So I was not, uh, um, uh, I don't have any regrets. I'm glad that uh, at least Avatar is continuing, you know, doing Warrior Nun comics. And I'm just glad to see the character still around. So, but you maintained uh, the rights, the media rights to to the character and the trademarks and and such, or did you? No, sell actually, those? the the media rights were uh, picked up by a company called Perfect Circle, and they're the ones who actually uh, own the media rights, and they're the ones who sold it to Netflix uh, okay. to make it a TV series. And um, uh, so far, that's the way it's been so far. Okay, so I want to take. Can we can we watch a little bit of a, a, a trailer from Warrior yeah. Nun? All right, I let's look at it. We'll look at. Now, as I understand, this is a couple minutes long. Is the action sequence? Uh, you. Uh, you know to me, the path of life. Oh, and I gotta say, what well, the funniest part? The the, <laughs> the, the subtitles are hilarious in this clip because we get the <laughs> sound effects. It's very comic booky. <laughs> I do like the look of the character. I mean, it looks really cool. I mean, that's something I just... Here, you can even go ahead and talk, man. I'll mute it, oh. and we can. Well, watch I mean, it. in the in the in the comic book, they do uh, uh, carry swords. Okay, but the thing about it is that the swords only affect supernatural or demonic creatures. They. They only pa they they pass harmlessly through people, and uh, uh, but uh, what it happens is the effect is it it sort of knocks them out, sort of like a taser or something like that. So it's it's a uh, it's just a weird thing I thought of to prevent them from actually just you know slicing limbs off and killing people all the time, you know, because uh, that's just one of those things I sort of made up to make it less to make it less violent, so to speak. Uh huh. Oh, and so is it? Is it? Is it a thrill to see this stuff adapted, even if they make changes or oh review gosh, the mind? Yes. That it's a total thrill for me. I mean, come on, it it 
what creator would not love to see anything that they've done, you know, in another media? And it's just that's one of the things that uh, uh, I think drives a lot of creators is that in the hopes that they'll their uh, creation will become something really, really big. Ooh, oh my gosh, that's a scary man. Oh, sorry, Alan Moore <laughs> staring you down for that last comment. <laughs> He's putting a hex on me. Stop it. <laughs> sorry about that, man. No, yeah, just, no problem. I'm just messing around. Okay, so well, so so great. Even though, I mean, is the studio treating you right? As far as the, the guys you picked up the rights, are they acknowledging you? Are you getting um, the screen credits and stuff that you want? Uh, and is yeah, it attracting I, more attention cool. to your other work? Uh, yeah, at the end of each episode, I get a created by, you know, so it's that's that's uh, something really, really cool. I mean, that's that's just awesome that they do they did that, and I'm just very happy about that. You know, I'm I'm just happy to see that it's a a, a success for them, you know, and that they're doing a second season. My hope is that. Uh, We'll see many more seasons after that. And I think Great. there's a lot of possibilities. You know, I, I purposely created the Warrior Nun universe so that, you know, you could exchange characters. You can uh, set it in any time period, you know, uh, and you could do just about anything with it. Sure. Got a lot of potential. That's great. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear. Uh, well, and I hope to hear that it's bringing attention to your other works and your and other deals are starting to happen or, or, or what? How What's the effect been? Uh, oh. the relief to this. Well, I mean, I've I've got uh, I've got uh, oops, hold on, I've got things in the pipeline that uh, I'm, you know I can't say at the moment because it's, it hasn't been finalized, you know. But uh, I mean, yeah, when you have something that's in the media, other media that uh, uh, has some sort of some success to it, you're going to attract other people who want to see what else you got, you know. Great. And hopefully, the we'll see what happens. But I'm not. Uh, I'm not uh, going to worry too much about it. I'm just going to keep doing my own thing and doing my own comics. Yeah, I don't know why you would, Ben. I mean, you've been creating so many of your own great comics for so many years. Um, but you have done dabbled for other publishers. Can we talk for a second? Tell me a little bit about uh, this one. Tell me about uh, the manga verse. <laughs> that is an interesting story. Okay, so, you know, back in the uh, early aughts, the manga started becoming more and more prolific, and you know Marvel's no fool. They see uh, you know things coming, and they thought that you know maybe we should get into this manga thing. Now, at the point at that time, I didn't know that they'd be at all interested in manga, but uh, I had a, f a pen pal um, from Japan who uh, was a huge fan of Marvel comics and DC comics, and we were exchanging correspondences, and he happened to be. Uh, he happened to be part of this uh, club that would do fanzines uh, uh, to promote Marvel and DC Comics, and he would send them to me. Now, he would show me their interpretations of Marvel and DC Comics in manga form, and it, that inspired me to say, wow, that's actually a pretty cool idea. So I decided to uh, uh, do up a, a, a proposal uh, just out of the code, you know, just decided, you know what, I'm just, if I don't do it, I'll never know. You know, that was my mentality. You know, so uh, I said, I'm going to put together a proposal. I'm going to send it to uh, Joe Quesada and Marvel, who was the editor at the time. And I was hoping for the best. You know, honestly, I didn't think I would ever hear another word from them. You know, once I sent that the package off, I would say, you know what, I, I, you know, at least I tried. But then I got an email from him saying, yeah, we want to do this. We want to do this Mangaverse thing. And I mean, I was shocked. I thought, wow, you know? And so uh, I sat down and I said, well, I better actually write a story. <laughs> and then uh, uh, just put together the, the Marvel Mangaverse for them. I, I think that was one of the most creatively fertile times at Marvel since like the original house ideas. Stan and Chad. What, what do you think about that era? <laughs> well, it those were pretty heady days for sure, you know. And I, I, I think you know. Uh, um, I mean, it, it, it was just a, a, a lot of luck and circumstance, you know. And yeah, Marvel. I love Marvel comics. You know, I I grew up reading Marvel comics. Uh, I was a Marvel zombie, you know. I mean, I like DC too, but it, for some reason, Marvel just had it. You know, just had that feel and the look and, and the stories that I just gravitated toward. So, 
you know, the opportunity, you know, and I tried getting into Marvel, <laughs> believe it or not, when I was younger, you know, but I never could. So to me, this was like a dream come true. You know, and yeah, oh, I agree with you. I think Marvel back then, I mean, they were, they were the, I mean, they were the bomb. They couldn't do anything wrong as far as I was concerned. I think Casada had a ton to do with that as creative, just the creative visionary behind it, because they were throwing so much at the wall. Um, also, what Axel Alonso at the time working for them was just bringing well, in yeah, all sure. kinds of. Because comics are a great medium to try new ideas. I mean, the thing is, is that you're not limited by budget. You're not limited. Well, you are limited a little bit by budget because you have to print the darn thing. But right. uh, 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 but other than that, you know, you can create anything out of whole cloth. You know, as much as your imagination can take you is the, the ability to do comics. And even nowadays, you can still do comics and cost you nothing because you can put it on the Internet. You know, and that's that's the big difference between uh, now and then is that okay, uh, did you, almost anybody who can draw can just post it online. Did you find that this brought a lot of attention to your work at Antarctic Press, maybe that you didn't have before? Did it lead to a bump for you? Um, I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I would like to think it did, you know, and uh, I'm proud of the work I did for, for Marvel, you know, and I uh, would uh, love the opportunity they gave me, but uh, I don't know. I, I think I'm just sort of have my little corner of the comic book uh, world and I'm just sort of happy with where I am. Okay. So let's move from that happy world into sort of a, 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 a slightly more controversial topic. Okay. So okay. Um, tell me a little bit about this book and about <laughs> job makers. Yeah. Well, tell me about how, how this came to you and how you got involved with this, the entire situation that led to, what we see today is, is in the world of comics gate. Well, all right. Well, um, I, I actually was familiar with Richard C. Myers uh, podcast. I mean, not podcast, a uh, YouTube channel. Um, he was just starting off uh, and he was starting to gain a uh, audience. Now I was unaware. I mean, I knew that he was doing a book called job breakers, but I was unaware that AP had anything involved with him at all. Um, apparently a, a, one of the editors, uh, um, Brian Denham uh, was familiar with the uh, with the book and offered to uh, publish it through Antarctic Press, and uh, um, I was not aware that they were doing it until one day I went to go visit, you know, the offices in San Antonio, and Joe told me about my brother Joe, who's the current publisher, uh, told me about it, and uh, and I said, yeah, that that sounds like a really good looking. That, I know of that book. I think it'd do really well. You know, and then when uh, the announcement was made, we had no idea the backlash that was to follow. It was unexpected, and we did not we're not pre we were not prepared for it. You know, because this is before things got really uh, the way they are now. You know, and we didn't. No one had ever seen anything like that. No one had ever predicted. You know, that kind of uh, reaction. You know, so tell me got, what form and, that reaction took and that backlash took when you say that. What are we talking about? Emails? Well, we made the announcement that we were going to do Jawbreakers, uh, you know, solicited through Diamond and, and printed through Antarctic Press. Uh, the backlash was almost immediate, you know, and uh, we were just getting slammed by uh, with lots of uh, hate emails and negative uh, feedback. And uh, I was there when... Uh, uh, Mark Wade called my brother. Um, he, uh, uh, I was not there privy to the conversation. Um, I was in another room because my brother would talk to him in private. So I'm, I wasn't there when the actual conversation took place. But then after he came out, um, you know, he he said he was going to think about what you know what was going on, and uh, when he came out, uh, we made the decision that we were going to cancel the book. And uh, I was, uh, I, you know, I never like to see any book being canceled, especially by people who um, are trying to bully their way in. And, uh, uh, but my brother just felt that this was the best course of action to take. And uh, he put a lid on all comments. You know, we didn't speak out or do anything after that. And of course, Richard Meyer went on 
with great success to crowdfund his book. And um, from what I understand, he's doing very well. So maybe it was ordained that this would, would happen. <laughs> Well, some people say that the controversy that this attracted is what helped, you know, really fuel the fire for that for that uh, uh, crowdfunding campaign. Yeah, I mean, there's that's probably there's some element uh, to that. I'm sure, um, you know, he probably had a huge following already, you know, that was ready to support him, no matter what. And so, uh, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, I'm, I'm happy that he's uh, successful, you know, and that he did uh, very well with it. And, uh, uh, right now we just, the only thing we can do is just say, well, you know what, um, you know, let bygones be bygones, let it go. Well, hindsight is twenty twenty here, but do you think if you were the publisher at that moment, you would have made the same decision your brother did? No, uh, me personally. Yeah, I was totally in control. I would have said no. I would have kept. I would have kept my word and kept. You know, I would have uh, uh, plowed through. I don't. You know, but honestly, I don't think uh, he would not have had as much success as he has now. You know, because I think the book probably would have come out. It would have sold pretty well, and then it would have just disappeared. You know, it, no one would have. You know, thought much of it after that. You know, but because of it. Uh, he was able to parlay that into something very big and successful. And, you know, I think it worked out in the end. Well, so it also turned into a huge lawsuit between him and, and Wade over, over this very issue, basically kind of the crux of it being that phone call that you, that you alluded to there. Um, yes. I don't want you to speak for your brother. I don't want you to speak out of school or anything like that, but um, what, what do you feel was the factor what what was the reasoning behind the decision? Strictly that um, Meyer had was was really bad PR to be involved with at Antarctic, and it could damage uh, your potential for sales. Or what what was the thinking? I'm just trying to trying to understand. Uh, well, I, I can't speak for my brother, you know, because you know he made the best decision he could at the time, you know, and I, I support him 100, percent you know, in that decision. Um, you know, the, the, the thing was, is that, uh, you know, we're of the mindset that, you know, we need to, to pick our battles carefully, you know, and just decide that this was the best course of action to take, you know, and, uh, um, his lawsuit we, we, we made our deposition, you know, and, uh, so it's, it's public it's for public record. So you can take I read it, it if you want to. Yeah, I yeah, read it. And so it, uh, it just, you know, we we did our thing, and you know, we left. And, and from what I what I got out of reading that, and the gist of it was that there wasn't any force or pressure put upon you guys to not publish it so much as advice that it that it probably would would be bad publicity for the company. Um, I don't know about that. Uh, you know, AP is one of those companies that just seems to go around and survive all sorts of manner of disasters. You know, um, we survived the black and white bus. We survived the 1990s crash. We, I mean, uh, you know, the, the thing about it is that we knew that uh, eventually, you know, time would heal, you know, whatever they, and we, at least I would like to think that, you know, and uh, as long as we basically um, kept our mouths shut, didn't disparage anybody, we didn't insult anybody, you know, we didn't call anybody names. So we felt that as long as we, uh, um, you know, had a positive attitude toward things, then we would uh, be able to uh, withstand whatever, you know, came our way. And I think that, uh, I think that's true. I think that you have. I don't think that I ever heard any kind of negative comments about Anarchic after the case. It was just very, it was a really confusing case to me. And still, there's still a lot that since it was settled, don't quite understand all the specifics, but I thank you for being so forthright and talking about what what you ha what you have so far. Um, oh. I want to shift into what's next. Like, what is the pandemic? What's next for for Antarctic? How did it shift or change um, your publishing plans? The the big distribution shakeup that happened over the last year year and a half. How, how did that affect you? How did the freezing of payments from Diamond? Um, well, I mean, 
I mean, I'm, I'm, I'll be honest with you. I'm not very privy to the, a lot of the financial aspects of AP. I'm more or less just the editor and a creator. Um, my understanding is that it wasn't pleasant. <clears throat> you know, the, uh, I mean, no company, you know, wants their payments suspended. I mean, it, it was definitely not a good thing, you know, for all involved. But um, for what I understand, um, Diamond did try to get sent out payments whenever they could, you know, because they, they, they knew that that would not be a good thing in the long run. And they had to uh, at least, you know, provide some sort of um, way to keep us, keep everyone afloat, you know, because, um, but I, like I said, I, it, I mean, we, able, we were able to survive. We were to weather it. You know, the good thing about it is like my brother is a very good at handling the finances of the company, which I think is one of those under you know, undersold things about publishing is that you have to be able to manage your finances. You know, you have to make a profit, you know, and if you don't make a profit, you're not going to last in business very long, you know, and he was very, you know, that was one thing he's much better at than I am. And so uh, uh, he was able to keep the company afloat, you know, able to keep things going. And uh, I have to applaud him you know, because I think he's one of the main reasons why, AP is still around today is that he's able to manage the finances. How, how many employees does Antarctic uh, have? I, I'm not sure. Um, um, I mean, I'm, that's my brother's purview. We have a lot of freelancers. We have a yeah. lot of creators. Um, I'm not sure how many actual employees AP has. Uh, I never bothered to ask because I figure it's none of my business. <laughs> <laughs> Too busy making comics, Ben. How yeah. many comics a year are you producing? I'm not still, the one them, so I'm not worried about it. But <laughs> how how many issues of Ninja High School a year do you do you try to put out? Well, uh, I'm going coming back to the art chores. My goal is to do once every month. I want to put on an issue every month. How many once pages? Uh, I try to do between 24 to 32 pages a month. Out of boy. Out of boy. That's a grind for the youngest of cartoonists, Ben. How is that working? You you feel like you can you can hit that number on a consistent year consistent basis? Oh well, yeah, I mean I've been doing it for the last 35 years. I can, I can do it for the next 35, so as long as I'm still around, as long as I can hold a pencil, I'll still keep doing it. <laughs> I love it. All right, I'm going to go to some Q&A here. Got a few people out there watching. Um, it said, Ryan Clater, a cartoonist, friend of the show, great guy. Once we move towards talking about Ben's more recent career, I'd be interested in hearing what he has to say about the coalition of independent comic publishers. Did that ever take off? And oh. is it still around? Do we still need it? And what is Ben's opinion on crowdfunding platforms like Kickstarter? Great question, Ryan. I know you do tons of um, crowdfunding, Ben. Let's talk about well, it a little bit. I'll be honest, I have not heard of the Coalition of Independent Publishers. Um, <laughs> so I don't have any opinion on that one. So if you can like me on that one, I'd, I'd appreciate it. But um, I never heard of it. I've never heard of it. Um, uh, I think every publisher is independent. So, you know, it, it just all depends. I mean, I I can't imagine a bunch of ind a public independent publishers actually forming a coalition because it'd be like trying to, you know, rodeo cats or – <laughs> well, I think That's it's fun. gone the other way, right? From co coalescing into um, atomizing, right? And now <laughs> we've got everybody's crowdfunding themselves. So tell us about what you know about your guys' kickstarting efforts, because I see you've done a lot of them. I I love crowdfunding. I think it's the future, to be honest. I mean, it's probably capitalism in its purest form for, you know, people vote directly with their money on the projects they want to support. You know, and if uh, I think this gives a wonderful opportunity for creators who wouldn't normally be able to get their ideas out there in a physical form uh, to get you know, to get the opportunity to do so, you know, and it, it's it's wonderful because uh, it just allows the ability for so many ideas and creations to get out there. Now, of course. You know, it is a wild west in terms of trying to get enough, you know, funding for your project. And uh, uh, but if enough people support it, then you can get it out there. And that's really the key, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, getting things out, you know, new that are different. Yeah, I love it. It's it's great. The only the only drawback is that uh, 
only the people who fund it directly will get to see your your creation. Yes. Um, the one advantage that a comic store has is that you have, you know, random people coming in who may discover your book. Yeah. You know? And that's to me, I think is, is almost as important as being able, you know, just to get people who directly want to buy your creation. I think it's more important because if you pull one, every one of those people that you can pull in, you know, everybody who's looking at your stuff knows you already. If they're buying it from crowdfunding, they know who you are. By definition, they want to support you. But how are you going to bring more people into that group to join, the, to make your crowdfunding efforts increase? There has to be outreach. And I think that's why I think the, the single issues of Ninja High School, that's interesting to me. Why in a... In, in a format like manga that traditionally the, the the individual story in a comic size pamphlet never really was the preferred format for that why have you stuck with it as long as you have and not gone towards say original uh, well, bound volumes yeah the thing about manga and in, in, in japan and comics here is the distribution method you know the uh, um here we're just used to the com pamphlet size comic books. Um, uh, and most of the comics being sold now is through the direct market. The, the problem was that when Marvel and DC abandoned the newsstand form of distribution, uh, more or less, then you no longer had a huge reach as you would, uh, uh, as you normally would. Now in Japan, they never abandoned that market. The market in Japan was that you had comics everywhere people uh, would congregate or walk by. Now, Japan is not the same kind of, you have to understand the culture there is different than it is here because here we're a car culture, okay? Unless you're in a big city, um, we get around in our own vehicles. Now in Japan, it's not so because Japan is a much smaller country. So the landmass, and it's most of it's mountainous. So there's not a lot of, you know, livable landmass in Japan. So people commute everywhere. Your, your buses and trains and taxis and things like that, and they walk everywhere. And when they walk, they walk by newsstands and everything else. And when they're going to the train station, they walk by newsstands. So the, the way manga is distributed are everywhere. So that you know, if you feel like you want, while well, you're waiting at up for a bus, waiting at a train, you know, or when you're on your way home, uh, you can pick up a very inexpensive, you know, phone book size comic. You know, and uh, uh, for uh, and read it, and then dispose of it. See, that's another big difference, is that there's no collector's market in Japan. You know, I mean, yeah, they sell back issues, but there's not a, you know, manga price guide, you know, to you know where people. I mean, uh, there's not that that culture of collectors who uh, like there are here for comic books. You know, so, uh, but in in traditionally, I mean, uh, I can. Do my book in any size, you know, any size format or any page kind I want. It's just that traditionally, the uh, twenty-four you know, to thirty-two page format is just been what is expected for the amount of money that you're asking for a comic on a monthly basis, you know. And uh, I mean that that's just the way it is. And I mean, if if uh, and I I like the idea of doing it on a um, monthly basis because it disciplines me to actually sit down and do it. You know, make sure I get my book out on time, and then uh, over the uh, after a certain amount of time, I can collect the issues into a trade paperback. Because you know, once you do something, it's there forever. You know, you yeah. can, you know, you you can exploit it as long. I mean, heck, Marvel and DC are still printing comics they did 80 years ago. You know, so it's just like once you got it done, it's done. You know, and you can just keep using it over and over and over again. You know, I mean, how that's, that's, how much of your, uh, I mean, so. Do you try to keep uh, your previous your backlist in print at Antarctic as far as earlier editions of Ninja High School? Because that's often yeah. frustrating for new fans who come in and they want to get that old stuff, right? No, not, not, well, first of all, we do a lot of creator-owned stuff. So a yeah. lot of the creator-owned stuff is, is the first time only. You know, I mean, if the creator wants to let us do it, we can work ah, out a thing like I that. See. But you know, once we get the uh, once we print a book from a creator, it's theirs. They give, we give it back. They can do whatever they want with it. You know, so uh, um, but if if it's a company owned you know property like Ninja High School, yeah, well, we can uh, 
print reprinted as many times as we want. The problem is we don't have the warehouse space for it, you know, and we don't have, uh, um, you know, we don't have the perpetual demand that a Marvel or DC uh, comic has. But uh, every once in a while, you know, we go back to print a certain thing just because we feel like, oh, it's been enough time. Let's go ahead and reprint it and see if we can get audience. I mean, Marvel is just Marvel and DC is just about particularly Marvel about letting volumes go out of print. Don't get me wrong. It's there's there's an associated cost to printing and storing and everything else that a lot of people don't understand that makes it difficult to keep all the volumes in print. Sure, yeah, but you know, there's some stuff they still keep in print, like Watchmen. I think has been in perpetual print. That ain't ever going out of print. Yeah, it's well, never that's going only to go because out. well, that's only because if they let Watchmen go out of print. Uh, the rights go back to Alan Moore, right? That, that, Alan's oh, gonna, we can't have that happen, happen right? <laughs> <laughs> Alan's going to judge us right now because that was the deal he had, right? He It was supposed to be creator-owned, well, and there had think, never you, been a graphic novel that had not you, gone out of print. What do you think would happen? I mean, what do you think would happen if Alan Moore got the rights back to Watchmen? What do you think he would do with it? Great question. I think he would probably shop it around and he would sell it to probably like Pantheon or Random House or one of the bigger publishers now who are going after literary comics left and right. Well, the thing is, is that uh, if if DC were to stop publishing Watchmen, you know, they did the movie and they can still, you know, the movie belongs to Warner Brothers so they can do whatever they want with the movie version of Watchmen. You know, so even if Alan Moore were to get uh, Watchmen back, you know, Warner still has Watchmen. Boo! Alan Moore's so mad right now. I, I don't, I happen to know he's a big, big fan of the show right now. He's just. I love his stuff. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's fantastic. And I love, we love your stuff too, Ben. In fact, I, I got a I couple. Respect, I respect him because he's got, you know, he's, he's got a very, you know, uh, a Harry. A, a sense of honor to him, you know, because, you know, he refuses to take any you know, money from Hollywood based on yeah. his creation. Yeah, you, know, you got to admire somebody like that. You know, it takes, you know, of course, I wouldn't do that. But, you know, I have to admire someone who would uh, who would do something <laughs> like that. It just, it, it Man's like, I got principles, but come on. Yeah. You know, <laughs> okay, only, wait a minute. I'm only human, right? <laughs> Daniel Moeller, another great indie cartoonist. He draws something called Psychonaut Presents. Um, says, Ben, I love your work on XYR, a choose-your-own-adventure-style comic you did with Stuart Hopin. A buddy of mine and I recently did a video walkthrough of it. Tons of fun. <laughs> oh, my God. That is a long time ago. I was from Eclipse Comics, you know, back in the – Yeah. You know, and uh, uh, yeah, I had a really great time with that. It was enjoyable. It's nothing I'd never done before. You know, so it was really, really fun. You know, I, you know, that was back in the day when choose your own adventures things was a big thing, and uh, and maybe that's something that's due for a comeback. Could be. Well, do you ever read? Um, you ever heard of a guy named Ryan uh, uh, um, Jason Shiga? Mm, no. Who is he? Oh, you might. He, he, what has he done? He did a book called Sleep, and he did a book called uh, Meanwhile. For, that Abrams produced. It's a children's wow. book. It's a choose your own adventure comic, but it's, you go, it has tabs and you go from one panel to the next and, and it has branching panels that go into other pages and you flip the, it's an amazing work of genius. Oh, that sounds really cool. Actually. I think you might like his work. Yeah. I should check it out. out. Yeah. Um, Okay, what else have we... Oh, uh, Ryan Clater, he sends this link. We'll look at this later, but he says, Ben Dunn, Antarctic Press Co Publisher Coalitions. Somebody's been using your name in... in uh, <laughs> well, we'll I, may, I, may have, I may have signed something I shouldn't have. Well, we'll see. <laughs> ben, ben Dunn, Publisher of Antarctic Press, posted a recent call to action. So um, I'll have to look that up. And, and maybe... Uh. I Maybe could, I could have done something. I am covering up something here, Ben. It's pretty uh, obvious. Could, could be, you know. I may have. I'm, Do you think I'm you'd be willing to maybe come I'm back sometime and promote a future project or 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 more Antarctic it's press possible. comics? It's possible. I I just don't recognize the term coalition of independent publishers. Um, it's possible. I mean, I do a lot of stuff that uh, you know I. 
I may not, uh, I may have done and just forgot about. Well, either way, you've got some unforgettable stuff, Ben. And I, and I want to thank you for this interview. It's been great. You really uh, laid a lot out there. Anything that you want to make sure that the folks out there go check out? Well, uh, well, um, you know, uh, we want to say we support our local comic stores. You have a comic store. It's important that you support them. And if you do go to a comic store, you, we're hoping that you'll check out uh, Antarctic Press comic book. We uh, do several anthologies. If you're a creator, we have uh, Planet Comics, Jungle Comics, Exciting Comics, and Horror Comics that are open anthologies for anybody who want to give take a chance and send something in. You never know. Get, your, get yourself into comic book stores. You may be the next big thing you never know wow what are those titles called ben that's great i didn't know about those yeah we have uh, four anthologies um horror comics which kind of obvious uh exciting comics which is our superhero anthology we have uh jungle comics which is a revival of the golden age jungle uh and uh, we have uh planet comics which is also a revival of a golden age title um, which is uh, science fiction based. So uh, we, I believe in anthologies. I love anthologies. Uh, some people always say, oh, yeah, that, that anthologies are dead. No, I, I think anthologies are vital because they provide, you know, venues for new ideas and new creators, you know, while not having to, uh, uh, you know, take a risk, a finan a too hit of a big of a financial risk on a title that hasn't been proven yet. So, um, awesome. and, yeah. So Thank you, you take submissions and you pay an actual page rate for these things? Uh, we don't do page rates. We do based on royalty, which is uh, basically based on sales. Now, okay. yeah, I know that's, you know, not most ideal situation. But uh, unfortunately, uh, the way things are, page rates, <laughs> we have a saying at AP that, you know, page rates can kill a company, you know, because the, the thing about it is that, uh, I mean, we're upfront and we're honest you know, about everything. So any creator who wants to, we'll tell you exactly what you're getting into. And then you can make a choice whether you want to proceed or not. You know, we're not going to force you to do it and we're not going to, you know, beg you to do it. So, you know, it's really all up to you, you know. And I mean, I, to me, to, my feeling is that, you know, uh, you know, we would rather, you know, pay you what we can than pay you what we can't, you know. So yeah. it's just, you know, at least if we say we're going to pay you, we'll pay you. You know, that's the that's the important thing. You know, so we just want to make sure that uh, um, that if we don't promise anything, that we can deliver. But but the creators of those books, even in the anthologies, have full rights over their own work. After Absolutely, that? we uh, we lay no claim on any property that a creator has, you know, in any just, other media or, or anything like that, that, that work. Belongs we, to that want, we want, we want our creators to go on to yeah. bigger and better things. Cause you know, nothing yeah. would please me more, you know, to see something that we published, you know, be made into a billion dollar movie because we you know we can say we gave that, you know, gave that story its first opportunity. I think that's great, Ben. There's not too many anthologies out there, ones taking submissions especially, and that have the opportunity to actually get into comic shops. So really kudos Absolutely. on that. Well, we, we want to, you know, foster the next generation of creators, you know, because we want to, we feel that that's important for the, for the uh, industry to grow and to change and to evolve. You know what's crazy is I believe you when you say that, Ben, because I, I bet you, I hear you hear other publishers say that, but then they're not giving those kind of contracts to their creators. Yeah, my dad always said I should have been a used car salesman. <laughs> well, you sold it here, buddy. Thank you for coming in. I've, I've got to take off. I really appreciate you making the time and being so forthright. You were easy to get a hold of and 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 easy to talk to. I appreciate that. Well, it was my pleasure, Dan, my man. I mean, it was awesome. I loved it and. Uh, Feel free to contact me anytime. I sure will. Okay, I'm going to pull you backstage. i got to play my closing credits and get out of here. If you want to stick around afterwards, uh, I have a few minutes to talk if you do. If you don't, I understand. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Cool, thanks. I'll see you soon. Okay. Wow, Ben Dunn. You know, talk about a guy who's got decades and decades of experience just doing what he loves, seeing – the comings and the goings of the industry and all that time, all the indie comics companies that came and went 
producing comics of varying quality uh, and dubious business models. I think Antarctic Press is that rare thing. You got somebody with a creative vision and somebody with the uh, financial smarts to build a company that's sustainable around it. Not one that's focused on, I got to have a mega hit and we're going to get to X percentage of the superhero industry. No, he, he found that path and he took it. More importantly, I don't know who else has an anthology these days, let alone four anthologies in four different genres that you could submit your comics to. So I'm really going to suggest Got a lot of people that send their comics in to me. Well, you own those comics. Why not send them into Ben? And the worst you're going to get is maybe a rejection and maybe some advice. But the high quality of stuff that gets sent in to the million dollar mailbox, I know that Ben would publish some of you guys. I'm positive he would love to see the work of a Tony Farrow, of a Dan Moeller, of man, any of the guys that have sent in some amazing work to this show. So to see him so so focused on that on getting new creative talent giving them exposure but being real with them at the same time not blowing smoke up their rear end that is rare so i want to thank uh ben for coming in and 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 keeping it real speaking of keeping it real thank you for keeping it real and subscribing and liking we got some likes on this we got people watching this thing give us a thumbs up if you liked it how could you not like ben dunn so you got to give one for that if you got to give a thumbs down, give it for me, but tell me why, uh, and come back. I think the next show, since I don't have a guest, I think it's going to be the Million Dollar Mailbox, so send in some comments. I got two, so I will review those. Send them in. I need your comics. This show doesn't keep going. To tell you the truth, besides talking to amazing people like, like Ben, it's the free comics that I'm in this thing for. Sorry, folks. That's how it goes. Keep sending those books in, but I will spread them out. I will talk about them. I will show them to you. And when will I do that? I'm going to do it next time.